God, we thank you for your rescuing work in your son, Jesus, that we have been purchased by his blood, that we have a hope outside of ourselves that is sure and secure in him. Lord, now as we fix our attention to your word, I pray that those realities of who you are and what you have done and how trustworthy and faithful you are would impact our thinking, that we would be quick to hear, that we would have humble hearts, that we would be doers of the word as we consider what you have to say to us this morning from scripture. And so, Lord, help us now as we come to your word to be humble. Help us to have reverence for you. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Please be seated. You can open up your Bible to the book of James chapter 3, James chapter 3. If you received one of the Bibles that we handed to you, uh, James chapter 3 is going to be on the far right side of that on page 177. And as you guys turn there, I want you to imagine for a moment that you are standing at a trailhead getting ready to go on a hike, standing at the beginning of a trail. You've heard very little about this trail. People are coming and going casually. The entrance seems well kept, kept, and the path is easily distinguishable. How might you enter into that trail? What kinds of things might be on your mind? What kind of attitude might you have? Now imagine you're standing at the same trail From an appearance, everything looks good. However, off to the side is a sign, and on that sign, there are a number of warnings. Warning, rattlesnake beds ahead. Use extreme caution. Warning, ahead, three-foot wide path with thousand-foot drop on either side. Warning, mountain lions in this area. Warning, flaming arrows that could come at you at any moment. How would you enter that trail? What would, your, what would your disposition be towards that instruction? Would you find it oppressive? Would you find it discouraging? Would you find it overbearing, overreaching? Would you welcome it eagerly? an expression of love and care that someone would let you know how you might enter into that trail. Considerations for you to be aware of as you navigate a dangerous path. How you enter that trail will be greatly influenced by your understanding of the dangers that are on that trail. A greater sobriety, a greater carefulness and attention will undoubtedly be felt by the one who understands these dangers upon entrance. Well, what James is going to do this morning in our passage is he's going to spell out the dangers associated with the tongue. Dangers associated with our speech. And each one of us must understand these dangers, these realities of the tongue, which will then help us give appropriate, careful attention to our speech. James wants to protect us from entering into an area of extreme danger casually. James, in essence, is pointing out the dangers of the tongue and is saying, give careful attention to your speech. And how kind of this, how kind is this of James to do so? How kind of this is our God who knows so exhaustively the dangers of our tongue and yet helps us understand these dangers so that we might give appropriate care and consideration to our speech which if left unchecked can do irreputable damage. And so with this in mind, let's look together and read James 3, starting in verse 1, and we'll make our way through verse 12 this morning. James chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Verse 1, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. 
For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. Verse 5. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The very world of iniquity, the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life, and it is, and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing, both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. Give careful attention to your speech. Give careful attention to your speech. For each of us, there are dangers associated with our speech that we must be warned of. And as we give careful attention to our speech, we must understand these realities. In fact, understanding these realities, and we will see five of them this morning, will aid us in giving the appropriate attention to our speech. So, give careful attention to your speech, understanding, number one, the stricter judgment teachers incur. Number one, give careful attention to your speech, understanding the stricter judgment teachers incur. James begins this section with a warning. Look again at verse one. Let not many of you become teachers. And there is a universal reality for the teacher, and that universal reality is that when you exert authority over another, when you assume a role as a teacher, that role comes with stricter judgment. In that moment, your influence broadens, and your actions and words don't only influence yourself, but have an influence on those around you. And it's important to note that what James has in mind here is not limited to elders. It's not limited to pastors only. The word for teacher is broader than that, but to anyone who would seek to elevate themselves in a role of influence over another, a teacher of another. And this warning that not many should be teachers is to be understood in light of the consideration that is found in the second half of verse 1. Look at what he says. Knowing that as such, as a teacher, we will incur a stricter judgment. When you have authority over others and exercise that authority, you can impact one's thinking. Their actions, their convictions, and beliefs can all be influenced by your words. The decisions they make in life, the way they spend their time, the things they pursue what they spend money on. And you will be accountable for your use of your influence. We all will. And this reality brings with it a warning that not many should become teachers. And so there should be careful consideration. There should be careful consideration and restraint for the believer in his or her speech before that one assumes the role of teaching others. James is not leveling an attack upon the role of teaching We need teachers. We need people to be teachers. We need to be taught. He's seeking, rather, to restrain the rush to teach and to bring an appropriate amount of sobriety and competence to the one who is teaching. 
The issue James seems to be addressing here is not one of heretical teaching that must be immediately removed within the church. If that was the case, he wouldn't have used language like my brethren, and the content wouldn't be a warning, but it'd be a rebuke. James is seeking here to curb the danger of talkativeness, of reckless statements, of frothy rhetoric, of abusive language, of misleading assertions on the part of some of the members who seem to be quick to want to voice their thoughts and opinions without careful consideration of their words. And so James says, listen, those who teach will be judged with a stricter judgment. When you step into a teaching role, you are volunteering for a stricter judgment in what you say. The reality is, is that we're all judged in regards to our speech. We all will give account for the words that we say. And yet for those who teach, there is a stricter judgment. And if you're thinking, well, this doesn't affect me. I'm confident that I'm, I'm capable with my words. I'm capable with teaching others. I have, I have wisdom that needs to be shared. If, if you're thinking that, then... You need to continue to listen because you have not yet appropriately understood the dangers associated with speech. The dangers associated with the tongue. We must understand that words are powerful and we are fully accountable for every word we say. And if we are presenting ourselves as teachers of others, we are held to the stricter judgment in that. And listen, we are all susceptible, we are all capable of sinning with our speech. We all have sinned with our speech. No one is excluded from this warning. And look at verse two. James says, we all stumble in many ways. And this reality that we all sin in many ways should all the more sober us in regards to exerting ourselves as a teacher of others. We need to take the reality that those who teach are held to a stricter judgment very seriously in light of the reality that we all sin in many ways. We all have moral lapses and failures in doing what is right. We fall individually and personally in many ways, and this is all the more reason for us to be careful with our speech, especially when assuming the role of a teacher. Because if everyone sins in many ways, How careful, how calculated must each of us be with our speech when we are exerting authority over another and bringing with it influence. I'm not only capable in that moment of bringing destruction on myself, but I can very easily hurt others very badly. So what are some practical areas where we might quickly assert ourselves as teachers? Well, for one, social media. It seems that people find themselves much quicker to exert their their thoughts, to, to express their thoughts, to try to convince others of their thoughts on social media. And the reality is, is that your audience is much broader. So it should be the opposite. You shouldn't move quickly as if social media is a safe place to share your thoughts and your ideas that you want to convince others of, you should move much, much slower. The amount of influence in a one-on-one conversation is very different than if you were speaking to 10,000 people. And if you went on social media recognizing that multitudes of people will have access to your words and you are accountable for that, and if you are exercising authority over others, if you are assuming the role of a teacher in that context, you are accountable for those words and the influence that they bring on those who hear. Some other areas. The church, there should be a great, great sobriety, great trepidation within the church before we want to assume roles of teaching others and imparting wisdom towards others. Children, how about at home with your siblings? None of us are are excluded from the accountability of the words that we say. So give careful attention to your speech, understanding, number one, the stricter judgment teachers incur, 
And next, give careful attention to your speech, understanding number two, the directing influence of the tongue. The directing influence of the tongue. James first talks about the influence of your speech and and what that has on others and that there is a stricter judgment because of that. And now he transitions to help us understand the directing influence of your speech on you. Where your speech goes, you go. Where my speech goes, I go. And he starts in the second half of verse two saying, if anyone does not stumble or sin or falter in what he says, he is a perfect man. And this word perfect, we have seen a couple of other times in James, and James again uses it here to refer to being mature or complete. If one doesn't stumble with their speech, they are a mature person able to bridle the whole body as well. James is saying, bridle the whole body. And when he says that, he's referring to the entirety of who you are. What you are will show itself by what you say. Your spiritual maturity will show itself or demonstrate itself by your speech. And where your speech goes, you will go. In your fight against sin, in your fight for self-control, start with the battle for your speech, of your speech. And if you can control your tongue, you have hope in the battle for the rest of your body as well. That's the kind of influence that our speech has on us. To bridle your whole body means to restrain it in all its members, including the tongue, which is the hardest to restrain. And to bridle your body gives the imagery that if you were to leave yourself unbridled, your whole body would run into sin, going whichever way it desires, then the sinful inclinations and desires that are there when left unrestrained rush to evil. You are your own worst enemy. I am my own worst enemy. Remember James 1.14, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust, his own strong passions. Bridle your tongue and you have hope to bridle your whole body and to not be carried away by your own lusts. We must understand the directing influence our speech has on us. And James gives two examples that help us understand the directing influence of our tongue or or of our speech. And here we see the power of the tongue to control the trajectory of who we are. And the first analogy James uses to demonstrate the directive influence of the tongue is the illustration of a horse in a bit. Look again at verse 3. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. If I were to take you to a thousand pound animal and hand you a five inch piece of metal and say, control that animal with this piece of metal, what would you think? If you were unfamiliar with horses, you would think that I was crazy. And yet this is a very appropriate illustration. As a bit sits in a horse's mouth, it rests on top of the tongue and horses have front teeth and then they have back molars and there's a gap in the middle. And so the bit fits on top of the tongue in that gap. And there's usually leather straps attached to the bit and that comes up around the horse's head and mouth and that's the bridle. So there's a bit and a bridle, but it's that bit in the mouth of the horse that is actually directing the horse. When that bit is attached to a bridle and then the the reins, which is what the rider holds, when that rider directs those reins, it adjusts that bit and easily makes the horse obey the rider's wishes. Controlling horses, controlling a horse's head directs the entire body. And you might have found this true, women with your husbands, when they're driving. And they say, hey, look. They start to turn. And you go, no, don't look. I'll look. You drive. <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, I've never done that. <laughs> Julie's never had to say that to me. While the most rebellious, stubborn of horses can be controlled with the proper application of a bit, 
the most gentle, rideable horses can suddenly become uncontrollable when that bit is removed. So it is with us. To be pleasing to the Lord, we need our tongues to be under control. We need our speech to be under control. We need our speech to be bridled, that the rest of who we are might follow, and the repercussion of an unrestrained tongue is an unrestrained life, and yet the repercussion of a well-bridled tongue is a life with a body that is under control also. The next illustration James gives is that of a giant ship that is directed by a small rudder. This is also what the tongue is like. Look at verse 4. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. James's point again is that in comparison to the size of the vessel, which is driven by strong winds, the rudder is very small. And yet this very small rudder can easily steer that ship wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it sets the trajectory. It is the directing influence on the rest of you. And James's conclusion to these illustrations is in verse 5. He says, so also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Like a bit in a horse's mouth or a rudder of a ship, the tongue has the power to control the rest of us. It is master control for the whole body. James is making the point of the smallness of the tongue and the greatness of the effect. Thus, to think we can say whatever we want and there be no impact on our actions on the rest of us is utter foolishness. Your tongue has a directing influence on you, and this can be for that which is pleasing to the Lord and that which is offensive to the Lord. For that which is sinful. And it's good for us to consider how have we given, how have you given careful, intentional thought and prayer to your speech? How do you do that? What is your practice for giving careful, intentional care to your speech? What grid do you have in place that helps you think about what and when you speak? Do you know your own strengths and weaknesses in your speech? We must echo the sentiment of David who in Psalm 39 states, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. Give careful attention to your speech. Understanding first the stricter judgment teachers incur. Give careful attention to your speech. Understanding the directing influence of the tongue. And next, number three, give careful attention to your speech. Understanding the destructive potential of the tongue. The destructive potential of the tongue. You must understand the destructive potential of your speech. Your tongue is the most dangerous part of you. James illustrates this great great danger and destructive power of the tongue using the imagery of fire. And while fire is one of the most useful things to humans, fire is also the perfect illustration because of its incredible propensity to destroy. It's unique in nature. The smallest fire has the potential to spread and grow and escalate into a huge fire. Fire can destroy your house and all of your possessions in less than an hour. It can reduce an entire forest to ash and charred wood. It's also a terrifying weapon with nearly unlimited destructive power. Typically, fire comes from a chemical reaction between oxygen in the atmosphere and some sort of fuel. The dangerous thing about the chemical reactions in fire is the fact that they are self-perpetuating. The heat of the flame itself keeps the fuel at the ignition temperature so it continues to burn as long as there is fuel and oxygen around it. The flame heats in any surrounding fuel so it releases gases as well and when the flame ignites the gases, the fire spreads. Water cannot expand into a flood. 
But fire feeds on itself, and where there is fuel and oxygen, it will burn and burn and burn. And James says at the end of verse 5, you see it there. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. We can relate living in Arizona to this reality. One spark and a whole forest can go down. The most devastating fire in the United States history was ignited in Wisconsin in 1871. Over the course of the next day, it is estimated that somewhere between 1,200 and 2,400 people lost their lives and 2 billion trees were consumed by the flames. The blaze began at an unknown spot in the dense Wisconsin forest. It first spread to the small village of Sugarbush, where it is believed every resident was killed. High winds came and sent the flames to 200 feet, racing northeast toward a neighboring community of Peshtigo, and temperatures reached 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, causing trees to literally explode into flames. On October 8th, the fire reached Peshtigo without warning. 200 people died in a single tavern. Others fled to nearby rivers where several people died from drowning. There were some who sought refuge in nearby water tanks and were boiled to death when the surrounding fire heated the water. Horrific, horrible destruction. Hateful, false, heretical, or even just careless words can bring great destruction. With every word spoken, there is potential for great danger. James says at the end of verse five, see how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. One Uncalculated word. Verse six, and the tongue is a fire. There isn't a more sobering description. The absolute damage that can be done with our speech is massive. In verse 6, James goes on and describes four dangers associated with the tongue that demonstrate the destructive potential. Look again at verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. First, it is the very world of iniquity. The tongue, it is the very world of iniquity. It is a system of evil, evil, rebellion, lawlessness. It is a source of unrighteousness. No other body part is like it or can be compared to it for the range of evil influence that it possesses. It is an avenue of expressing every kind of sin. With your tongue, you can express every kind of sin imaginable. You could say that ungodly speech is, in the, is the embodiment of all wrong. Every wrong emotion, every sinful thought, every wrong action can be put into words. It is a very world of iniquity. Second, it defiles the entire body. It is said among our members as that which defiles the entire body. This member, our tongue, spreads and contaminates the rest of the body. Like a toddler's backwash can contaminate your cup of water. <laughs> the foulness of an unbridled tongue defiles the entire body. The system of evil, which is our tongue, does not merely defile itself, but all of who we are. Thirdly, sets on fire the course of our life. Do you see that in the text? The next danger associated with the tongue is that it sets on fire the course of our life. This expands more the principle that the, dis- that the tongue is destructive to your being. The original literally reads the tongue sets on fire the wheel of existence. Not only you, but 
throughout the course of your life, your tongue has the potential to contaminate everything about you and everything around you. And the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is just completely false. Not only do your words have the complete capability to defile your entire body, but the very course of your life and existence can be burned up into flames because of an unchecked tongue. How you go in this life is dictated in large part by how your speech goes. And then lastly, the sinful tongue is set on fire by hell. Do you see that? The tongue is set on fire by hell. The word for hell here is Gehenna, which means Valley of Hinnom. This was a deep gorge southwest of Jerusalem where trash and garbage and the bodies of dead animals and executed criminals was taken and dumped and continually burned. And the location had originally been used by the Canaanites. And then also sinful, rebellious Israelite worshipers to sacrifice their children as burnt offerings to the pagan god Moloch. This atrocious practice was permanently ended by King Josiah of Judah. At that time, the place was considered to be unclean and unusable for anything respectable, and it therefore became used as a garbage dump where all the filth of the city of Jerusalem and surrounding areas was taken to be burned. And because the fire burned all the time and maggots were always present, Jesus used Gehenna to represent the eternal, never-ending fire and torment of hell. Jesus in Mark 9 described it as the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Because hell is a place prepared for Satan and his demons and all who reject Christ, James, when saying the tongue is set on fire by hell, is saying your tongue or your speech can be Satan's tool, fulfilling Satan's purpose to pollute, corrupt, and destroy. Your tongue has a propensity for evil and can bring a devastating effect. If ever there were a terrifying statement about the tongue... And if what you've heard, what we've read regarding the tongue up to this point hasn't brought about utter trepidation, this reality must. Even the most mature, the most godly saint, in a moment of unguarded use of their tongue, can be used to bring about Satan's purposes and can bring devastating destruction upon those around them. We must give careful careful attention to our speech. Give careful attention to our speech, understanding, one, the stricter judgment teachers incur, number two, the directing influence of the tongue, number three, the destructive potential of the tongue, and next, give careful attention to your speech, understanding the untamable nature of the tongue. The untamable nature of the tongue. Look at verses seven and eight, how James describes it. He says, for every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. James here simply points out that the tongue is uncontrollable and untamable. Controlling your tongue when left to your own devices is an impossible task. From lions and tigers to elephants, humans can tame them. From snakes and whales, humans can tame them, control them, bring them into submission. Birds of the air can be caught and caged, but the tongue, the tongue cannot. It is a restless evil. No person in their own power can tame their tongue. Even in the Christian, the tongue is able to easily slip out of control and be greatly damaging. We cannot trust in ourselves to keep control of our tongue. And the word restless here is like a wild animal fighting fiercely against restraints. 
It is violently trying to escape, and this is what your tongue is like. This is what my tongue is like. It wants to be unleashed. Every moment of every day, in verse 8, James describes it as this restless evil. It is seeking to promote and do evil, and it is deadly. The tongue is like a cornered beast that is going to do everything in its power to be unleashed and to wreak havoc upon everything it crosses. And its venom is more deadly than any creature's because the breadth of its destruction is really limitless. The poison of your tongue, it can destroy yourself and others morally Socially, economically, most importantly, spiritually. Careers can be lost by one careless word. Relationships can be ended. Reputations ruined all by our speech. And no man can tame it. James, thank you for giving us this uplifting, positive message this morning. There is a positive message. And it's this, while things are impossible with man, they are possible with God. While there is an untamable nature in our speech when left to our own devices, if you are in Christ, you are not alone in regards to this. You have the spirit of God in you. And by God's grace, there is hope in this battle. And when what is left to yourself is a world of iniquity filled with deadly poison, you can actually tame and use for the glory of God. You can bring under control. He's given to you all things pertaining to life and godliness. There's no temptation before you that he has not also provided a way of escape. You can bless God. You can do good. You can bless others. You can please the Lord. We must recognize the imminent danger that is our tongue, and we must be on guard. There can be no complacency in regards to our speech. And by God's grace, we can honor him with it. Lastly, give careful attention to your speech, understanding this. Understand the unacceptable disparity of the tongue. Unacceptable disparity. Your tongue has an incredible potential to state one thing and then the opposite, right? For there to be disparity in your speech, inconsistency, to have a contradictory nature found within our speech. And this is unacceptable before the Lord. It should not be this way. We can communicate one thing and then just a moment later communicate the opposite. We can compromise. We can be treacherous. The tongue is a hypocrite, eagerly willing to deceive and to contradict. Look at verse 9. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. That's one side. And then the disparity is found when we do what's next, and that's with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. With the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father. This is good. This is what we should do. This is wonderful and appropriate. This should be the primary objective of what we use our speech for. Yet with that same tongue, we curse men who have been made in the image or likeness of God. The Jews were used to blessing God. They did this, they did so at the end of each of the 18 eulogies or benedictions that they prayed three times a day, saying, blessed be thou, O God. But with that same tongue that would bless God at least 54 times a day, they also would curse men who are made in the likeness or image of God. Even in our fallen state, we still bear the image of God. And in James's mind, the opposite ends of the spectrum are that we would, is that we would use the tongue to bless God and then curse men. To curse men is to literally call down curses upon. In order to do this, a person must think highly of themselves over and above those whom he is showering with insults or remarks and declarations of. This is personal abuse expressed through the loss of temper, heated conversations or controversy or disputes. This isn't merely the use of profanity or vulgar speech, 
but rather seems to be capturing the idea of any angry dispute where slanderous remarks are made and condemning conclusions are declared during conflict. And in this context, it seems to be happening even within the church. That is disparity. That is inconsistency. That is hypocrisy. And how tragic and how hypocritical is it that from the same mouth comes blessings and curses? Yet all of us have been guilty of this kind of disparity in our speech. James' statement at the end of verse 10 sums it up. These things ought not to be. This disparity is unacceptable. It shouldn't be this way. There's no place for this use of the tongue in the Christian life. And when God changes us, he gives us the capacity for new, redeemed, holy, God-honoring speech. And he expects us to use our tongue even with all the dangers to honor him. So how might we do this? What exactly is the call for the Christian in regards to their speech? What should I aspire to with my tongue? And you don't need to take these down. I have them. You can just listen right now. I have them listed on my web outline. You can download it and get it there if you'd like all the references uh, from the church website. But just listen for a moment at what God-honoring speech looks like. What is the call for the Christian in regards to our speech? Ephesians 4.30, we're to speak, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Ephesians 5.4, we're to use our speech to give thanks. 1 Peter 2.9, to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Colossians 3.17, we're to do everything in word and deed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 10.32, We are to use our speech to confess Jesus as Lord. Colossians 4, 6, we are to let our speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that we will know how to respond to each person. 1 Peter 3, 15, we must be ready to give an account for the hope that is in us, yet with gentleness and reverence. Ephesians 4, 15, we must speak the truth in love. Hebrews 3, 13, we must encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today so that none of you or none of us is hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We must use our speech to encourage one another, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Also there, build up one another, to spur one another on towards love and good deeds, Hebrews 10.24, to confess our sins to one another, James 5.16, and also in James 5.16, to pray for one another. These are just some of the instructions that we see regarding the Christian and the tongue. That is God's desire for how we might use our speech. James closes his instruction on the tongue with three illustrations that demonstrate the fact that it is not right for such disparity to exist in our speech. The first is with a question. Look at verse 11. Does the fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? And the obvious answer is no, it doesn't. This is a universally known fact that a spring or a fountain does not produce both fresh and bitter water. And so it should be with our speech. Another rhetorical question, verse 12, can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? And once again, the emphatic answer is no. It's against nature and it cannot happen. It should be so lost in our minds that we would do these these contradictory things, that it would just go against nature for us to bless God and curse man for that kind of disparity to exist. Lastly, James states, nor can salt water produce fresh. James doesn't give any stated conclusion from these illustrations, but the point is clear. The inconsistency of the tongue of a believer is condemned. The call in our passage is to give careful attention to our speech and by God's grace, through God's means, control our speech. To exercise the grace given to us to put away speech that is displeasing to God, to use our speech for that which is honoring to him. It's just such a joy to be a, a part of a body of Christ that is living this out so well. 
the amount of encouragement, the, the amount of truth, the amount of patience when wronged, the amount of, of restraint when there's disagreement is such an evidence of God's grace in, in your lives, in the lives of, of you in this church. And I'm so grateful to God for that. I've experienced that, seen that, heard that. And yet the dangers are ever present and real. In just a moment of uncontrolled speech, in a moment of being provoked, we can say incredibly hurtful things, dishonoring to the Lord and unloving towards one another. I can't count the amount of times where something has come out of my mouth and immediately, oh, go, no, why did I say that? Oh, it's heartbreaking that those whom we love so dearly, we could hurt so badly by just not giving care to our speech. So let's excel still more. Let's continue to give appropriate attention, to recognize the danger that each one of us possesses, which is our tongue. And let us seek to honor God. Our speech has a bearing on our lives. Our speech has a, a bearing on the life of this church. And while the tongue boasts of great things, we have been redeemed by grace through Jesus and have something actually worth boasting in all the more, and that is our Savior, Jesus Christ. While the disparity that exists is one that worships God, blesses God, seeks to honor God, and then curses men, we must seek to be on the side of blessing God with our speech of honoring him, of loving one another, of remembering his greatness and proclaiming it richly. And so let's do that now. Would you pray with me? And then we'll stand and we'll sing and we'll rejoice and glory and boast in our great God. Let's pray. Father, what, a, what an evidence of your kindness and love towards us to warn us to help us see the danger that is ever present within ourselves in our speech and our tongues. And Lord, as we just ponder for a moment the, the sinfulness that each one of us has expressed through our mouths, I pray that we would be impressed all the more by your grace and your love and your willingness to send your son to be a substitute for sinners such as us. What kind of God would send his own son to die for those who sin so profusely with their mouths? Prior to knowing you, all we wanted was to suppress the truth about you, to live for ourselves, to just be an abomination before you in our sinfulness. And yet now, by your grace, we are redeemed and we are saved with you as our Lord and our master, and that is much, much better. And so, Lord, help us to be self-controlled. Help us to not only think of what not to say, but help us to say only what is pleasing to you. That you would be glorified. That's our desire. That our love for you, our love for each other would be seen in the way that we use our speech that you would be glorified. So now, Lord, we want to lift up our voices and our hearts as we know that from the mouth, the heart brings forth. And so, Lord, we want to, we want to proclaim your excellencies. And where we have faltered in believing these things and thinking rightly about these things, I pray that this time would be a recalibration for our hearts to fix our hearts and our minds on that, what, that which is true, that which is good. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.